Have you ever heard of a protein called beta-catenin? No? Well, that's because it's a popular one in cell biology and human physiology, but it's not a common one in the clinical world. But research strongly indicates that it plays a powerful role in keeping inflammation throughout your body in check. The same inflammation linked to diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and more. And the kicker? Your nutrition can severely reduce its levels in your body, leading to greater inflammation and greater disease risk. So let's discuss what beta-catena does, why it's important, although you've probably never heard of it, and what to do to keep it elevated in your body. This actually starts in your body fat, specifically a type of body fat called visceral fat. Visceral fat wraps around and in your organs, and it's been heavily linked to inflammation. But exactly how it contributes to bodily inflammation has been a point of heavy research considering its links to health harm. We'll touch on that later again. So, in this study, the researchers uncovered how visceral fat controls your immune cells, and they even showed how to control your visceral fat to stop causing a pro-inflammatory state through its immune control. What the researchers did is take visceral fat samples and separate out the cells found inside the visceral fat. They can do that using a research technique called FACS, or Fluorescent Activated Cell Sorting. Essentially, they identify cells by specific features on the cell surface, like you recognize people that you know through looking at features on their face. We can see that data here. I realize this looks like a lot, but it's actually pretty simple. Just unfocus your eyes and pay attention to where the color is located in each square. On the far left, they're separating out specific sections of the visceral fat, and as they move to the right, they're using finer and finer tooth comb to separate out only immune cells, removing fat cells and other cells called stromal cells, until we end up at the end. The cells that have a ZDC GFP on the bottom axis there. If the cells have high levels of ZDC, they are a particular type of immune cell called a dendritic cell. And if they have less on the left there, they have a different immune cell that isn't a dendritic cell called a monocyte. The takeaway here is that your fat contains immune cells, of which a subpopulation are dendritic cells. Okay, well, <laughs> why does that matter? Well, we're talking about inflammation, which is heavily reliant on these subpopulations of cells. These dendritic cells are what's known as antigen-presenting cells, meaning that they literally present or activate the rest of the immune cells to be more pro-inflammatory. They'll start releasing molecules that lead to a more aggressive immune system called cytokines, and they'll physically activate more specialized immune cells. But we clearly don't want that if there's no infection or no need for the immune system to be active. So keep that in mind. Unnecessary inflammation is bad, and dendritic cells play a key role in inducing inflammation. Okay, so the researchers have this population of dendritic cells, and even within the dendritic cells, there is a subpopulation, in this case, CDC1 and CDC2 dendritic cells. Here, we're looking at key proteins within both subpopulations of dendritic cells. Notice the designations up top. Then, on the right, we have a few different proteins. You might recognize one of them. That's right, beta-catenin. Since we're measuring protein levels, just think of the darker and larger the splotch, the more protein is there. Clearly, the CDC1 dendritic cells have far more beta-catenin, because if you compare the two, there's a darker splotch. Okay, but we now have our introduction to beta-catenin, but how does that translate to inflammation? Well, there's a common marker of inflammation. Remember when I mentioned that immune cells, like dendritic cells, release different pro-inflammatory factors called cytokines? Well, a common one is called interleukin-6, or IL-6. You can actually get this test done for yourself, at least on a whole body level. So the more IL-6, generally that's an indication of more inflammation, a bad thing in this context. Okay, so here we have IL-6 levels. We don't need to go over all this, don't worry. The researchers are using a pro-inflammatory stimulator there, GLA. So sometimes you see a plus, you know they added the inflammation stimulator. If the bars go up, that means there's more IL-6, so greater inflammation signaling. And we see that's true for both dendritic cell subtypes in visceral fat, here and here. 
However, the researchers were interested in finding out what happens when you stimulate beta-catenin. So, they added beta-catenin activator called SB216763, which was the runner-up for the name for Terminator, but they ended up going with T800 because uh, this molecule had dibs. So, when SB is also added to the cells, you can clearly see there's a huge decrease in IL-6. And notice how it's only really dramatically effective in the CDC1 dendritic cells. That makes sense considering we know it has more beta-catenin in it. So the takeaway here is that certain dendritic cells found in visceral fat have higher levels of this protein called beta-catenin. And activating this protein dramatically reduces inflammatory profile of these cells, at least by this measure. But I'll go ahead and tell you that the researchers confirmed these results across other measures as well. All right, we see the connection between beta-catenin in our immune cells and inflammation, but I did say visceral fat controls these immune cells, but we haven't proven exactly how. The researchers took similar samples of visceral fat and measured proteins known to activate beta-catenin, called the Wnt pathway. Specifically, Wnt10 is the name of the protein. Now, I won't bore you with the data, but they show that there's a big increase in Wnt release by the visceral fat tissue. And when they applied Wnt to the dendritic cells, look, it's the same conditions measuring IL-6, and we're still applying this GLA inflammatory molecule and SB activator for the beta-catenin. And They've also added this Wnt10 protein, and you can clearly see there's a huge reduction in IL-6 pro-inflammation signaling. And beyond that, it's equivalent to the beta-catenin-specific activator, offering greater credence to the idea that beta-catenin is activated by Wnt, and this is how visceral fat reduces inflammation. Wait a minute, guy. Visceral fat reduces inflammation? That's not what you were telling me earlier. Well, that's true, but just because we see Wnt does reduce inflammatory profile doesn't mean that visceral fat is continuously releasing Wnt. And that's actually where your nutrition plays a role because it can increase or reduce Wnt from your fat tissue, thereby indirectly affecting beta-catenin. So before we get to that, there's a lot that I skipped over on the beta-catenin, like its other unique effects in our immune system, but there's also another powerful protein that has similar benefits, but works differently, and is also heavily affected by different habits, along with more targeted ways of improving the anti-inflammatory effects of dendritic cells, and a lot more. But since I can't cover it here, I'm covering it in the extended version of this video that you're watching, which is included with the Physionic Insiders, my premium research platform. And wouldn't you believe it, you get so much other stuff if you join. Like the stuff on the screen right now, a podcast, live sessions with me, and more. Link is in the description if you're interested. So, why would visceral fat reduce Wnt release, thereby reducing beta-catenin and encourage a pro-inflammatory state? Well, the researchers have been testing all this in mice and simply changed their diet and then measured a whole host of different Wnt proteins, as seen here. That line across them is the normal Wnt levels, and if they fall below that line, the diet leads to significant reductions in Wnt. Now, while some look like they reduce, we only see a statistically significant effect for the very same Wnt protein that we looked at earlier, Wnt10. Further, if we look at the same beta-catenin protein levels on the normal diet called Chow, or this other diet, WD, can you guess what that stands for? And we compare the protein levels in the same CDC1 dendritic cells, we see a reduction in beta-catenin. So the takeaway here being that our diet can reduce Wnt release from visceral fat tissue and our diet can reduce the levels of this anti-inflammatory protein, beta-catenin. So what is WD and does this apply to humans considering the mechanism nature of this study and what can be done to encourage more Wnt signaling and greater beta-catenin levels? WD, for those that didn't figure it out, stands for Western diet, or more specifically, a diet rich in sugar, saturated fats, and calories. So by these data, a poor diet classified as a Western diet here increases the odds of a pro-inflammatory state by our visceral fat. Now, while I'd love to tell you there's strong research indicating a link between beta-catenin and Wnt and chronic disease, I can't do that. There's a few studies that look at beta-catenin in humans, but they are sparse. 
and tend not to look at the outcomes that we're interested in. In addition, some show increases, some show decreases, again, because there's a lot of differences between studies. So, no, there's currently little good research linking beta-catenin, Wnt, and inflammation from visceral fat. However, there are plenty of studies that show a strong link between visceral fat and inflammation in humans. So, while we can't confirm the finer details, the overall point seems pretty strong. Visceral fat can contribute to a pro-inflammatory immune profile, which in turn is linked to worse health. So, how do we encourage beta-catenin and reduce this pro-inflammatory state? A quick mention, I could have easily made some pretty incredibly bad jokes about beta-catenin because, okay, listen to this real quick. Beta-catenin is activated by Wnt when Wnt binds to a receptor called frizzled. Yes, frizzled, like uh, the magic school bus, Miss Frizzle. But it gets better because frizzled activates a protein called disheveled. I find those names hilarious. I mean, frizzled and disheveled are saving you from inflammation by protecting beta-catenin. Sounds like some parents taking care of their kids in the morning, pre-coffee, on a Monday. Frizzled and disheveled. Too funny. Anyway, how should we summarize this and what are some easy, actionable takeaways? Well, we learned that visceral fat tissue can change the amount of wind protein it releases, which binds specific immune cells called dendritic cells. These dendritic cells, once bound by wind, have more active beta-catenin, which reduces the amount of pro-inflammatory molecules like interleukin-6 from being produced, among other inflammatory benefits. A typical Western diet reduces Wnt release by visceral fat, leading to reduced beta-catenin and increasing inflammation, which tracks with greater disease risk. So, a few things that you can focus on to maintain elevated beta-catenin are, one, eat more satiating foods, whole foods. It'll make a big difference on if you overconsume or not. Two, in the same vein, cut the ultra-processed foods. They do the exact opposite. Number three, Reduce the number of times that you eat out per week. Most foods made in restaurants are highly calorically dense. Four, simply cut back or eliminate calorie-rich drinks like sugary drinks. Soda is a perfect example. All those contribute to a Western diet and the negative effects that we just went over, but there are also ways of reducing visceral fat dramatically as well as nuances related to visceral fat that I cover right here. I'll speak with you over there. Thanks for tuning in.